grace, peace, and mercy be unto you all in the name of Jesus, the risen Christ. Amen. One of the greatest lies ever told once again reared its ugly head. No, not the, the great lie that there is no God. No, not that one. Not the great lie that God does not love you. Not the great lie that uh, Jesus was not God the Son, or not that he conquered sin or death or the devil through his own death and resurrection. No, not those great lies, but the other great lie. The sneaky and too often accepted lie that undermines God and God's design of his perfect creation. The lie was told to me by a friend. It came as a shock. It was a sucker punch. It came during a phone call while I was helping coach a soccer game. It was a phone call from my best friend in high school, letting me know that he just found out that our other good friend had died. And as I listened in stunned disbelief, my best friend read the obituary, and that is where the lie was written. The lie that our friend's death was a result of natural causes. Yes, that great lie. The lie that death is natural. You see, death is not natural. Death is a result of sin. God, who created all things, saw that his creation was good and right and perfect. And God made man special from the rest of his creation. He, he personally fashioned man from the dirt of the ground, and he breathed life into his nostrils, and thus Adam was created right and good and perfect with a heart and a soul and a mind with which to love God. And God gave man all he needed in the garden. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And then God, in his infinite wisdom, he sees that it is not good for man to be alone. Man needs a helper. So God performed the first surgery. He caused man to sleep, and, and he took one of his ribs, and he fashioned woman from such. And thus Eve is created right and good and perfect, with a heart and a soul and a mind with which to love God. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other, other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Did God really say? It should have been a simple yes. But the crafty and deceptive serpent, the, the father of all lies, made it not so simple due to the wretched, foul-smelling poison of the question being disguised and masqueraded and deceptively hidden by an alluring and irresistible sweetness of temptation. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food 
and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Man and woman did the one thing that God said not to do. One rule, one law, one command, broken. Sin had now just entered the world. I wonder if a dark cloud saturated the once perfect sky when sin entered the world. But it really doesn't matter what the sky looked like because sin caused a darkness to veil the heart and mind and soul. You see, sin changed everything. Sin. Such a small word with such a powerful punch. Sin is great. Deceptively great. Destructively great. Destructively powerful. So what is sin? Sin is a disobedience from God. It, sin is when we are not as God wants us to be, namely holy and right and good and perfect. There are two kinds of sin, original sin and actual sin. Original sin is our inherited sinful condition. It's it's a total corruption of our whole human character, is what is meant when Genesis 8.21 says, the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. When Adam and Eve fell into temptation and sin, the whole of the human race to be born from these two have a total corruption of the whole human nature that is passed on from parents to children and on and on. Original sin is not a sin we do or commit. It is a condition of our nature. It is the corrupt spiritual condition of our soul. Actual sin is every act against a commandment of God in thoughts and desires and words and deeds. It's what we do that we should not do. Those are sins of commission. Or it's not doing what we should do. Those are sins of omission. We commit sins of commission in our hearts by having evil thoughts and imaginations. And with our mouths by cursing and swearing and blaspheming and bearing false witness. And in our deeds, which come from the evil lusts of the heart. We are guilty of sins of omission when we do not fear and love and trust and praise God with all of our heart and soul and mind, or when we do not love our neighbor. The problem with sin is that sin changed God's right and good and perfect creation. Sin changes everything. It's like the time when my sister Amanda was learning to play basketball. When my sister was in high school in central Ohio, she, she broke our school record by making eight three-pointers in a single basketball game. Oh, sure, she had talent. And whereas Amanda went on to have success playing college basketball and college softball, and my other sister Natalie went on to play soccer and rugby in college, I unfortunately found myself in the shallow end of the athletic gene pool in our family. But I'd like to believe that I had something to do with Amanda breaking that scoring record. You see, I taught Amanda how to drive. No, not drive down the lane in basketball to score an easy basket, but rather I taught her how to drive a car. You see, Amanda needed access to our basketball hoop, or as y'all Texans say, a basketball goal. 
but the cars were always parked in the driveway blocking the basketball hoop. So unbeknownst to our parents, I taught Amanda at the age of 12 to how to drive a car so she could move the cars and practice basketball. We lived out on a farm after all. It, it had to be okay, right? Well, one night, while I was in my college dorm room, the phone rang. And when I answered it, all I could hear was my mother screaming at me. And when she calmed down a bit, she was able to angrily tell me what had happened. As my mother was doing dishes and looking out of the kitchen window into our backyard, she sees our Honda Civic flying in reverse and crashed into the dog pen and into our shed. You see, my sister's shoe had slipped off her foot and got wedged on the gas pedal and onto the floor mat. And so as the car went flying by in momentum and crashed into the dog pen and up and over a cinder block, the back wheels just kept spinning and spinning and spinning as the engine continued to be revved. Uh, the rear wheel uh, engine just continued to be revved because that shoe was wedged right there. Oh, my sister got in trouble. Oh, how I got in trouble. And I was three hours away. Well, a few months passed, and I thought it might be okay that I could come home to visit. And during my visit, I wanted to go out and see some friends. But my Geo Prism, oh, what a car. It got stuck in our driveway because of the dirt driveway we were on. It was, there was heavy rain that day, and everything turned to mud. I needed to go. Time was a-wasting. Only me and Amanda were home. I told her, you drive the car while I push it out of the mud. She wanted nothing to do with that. She was scarred from what had happened. And I said, okay, we'll have the windows down, and I'll talk you through it. It will be okay. Well, it wasn't okay. I pushed, and she hit the gas, and all the mud from the front tire just flew into the car. And me, well, all the mud from the rear tires just sprayed me. And when it was all said and done, you could only see the whites of my eyes. No, there was no going out with my friends that night. And I never really got the inside of that car ever cleaned again. You see, that's a lot like sin. Sin changes everything. Sin ruins everything. Just like how I and the inside of my car was caked in the filth of mud. Sin makes us dirty. So dirty that we can never get cleaned on our own. Just as my sister was scarred from her experience, sin scars us. Sin leaves deep wounds. Sin leaves us hostage to fear and guilt and shame, fear, guilt, and shame. That is exactly what Amanda, I'm sorry, that is exactly what Adam and Eve faced in the garden. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Afraid with fear, guilt so they hid, shame because they were naked. 
The problems that Adam and Eve faced in the garden is the same that we face today. Our sin leaves us hostage to fear and guilt and shame. But God loved his creation so much that he would not let the destructiveness of sin reign supreme. No, God provided a solution to the problem. He promised Jesus. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel, is what God said to the serpent. Jesus, at the right time, in accordance with God's plan, would bruise the heel of, would bruise the head of Satan, even though Satan would bruise his heel. As great as sin is, God's love is greater. As great as sin is, God's grace is greater. Jesus' heel would be bruised as he went to the cross but Satan's head would be crushed by Jesus' death and resurrection. And God lays out to Adam and Eve the consequences of their actions, the consequences of their sin. For women, there will be great pain in childbirth, but he still gifts them with children. Yes, sin is great, but God's grace is greater. For men, they will work the cursed ground. They will toil all the days of their lives. But he still gives them work and food. Yes, sin is great, but God's grace is greater. And then men and women will die and return to the dirt of the ground that they came from. No, death is not natural. Death is a result of sin and the fall of man. Death is a result of sin. And so to atone for death, a death is needed. A sacrificial death is needed. And God, in his love for Adam and Eve, even though they sinned, God causes the first sacrificial death. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. God takes a life, a precious life, a life that he said was right and good and perfect in his creation to now become a sacrifice as a garment of sin, a skin for clothing to cover Adam and Eve's shame. Yes, sin is great but God's grace is greater. Just as the problems of today's fear and guilt and shame are the same as found in our text, the solution for today is the same as our text. God promised Jesus in Genesis 3.15, and God gave us Jesus in John 3.16. Just as we just sang, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. God takes a life, a precious life, a life that he said was his son with whom he is well pleased, and God takes this perfect and blameless and sinless life to become the ultimate sacrifice. And so Jesus took our sin, and he took our fear, and he took our guilt, and he took our shame to the cross. Jesus took his perfect and blameless and sinless life to the cross so that we sinners would be forgiven. Yes, sin is great, but God's grace is greater. Yes, sin changed everything. Everything that is but God's love.
Praise be to God. Amen. Please pray with me. Dear good and gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you knowing that we are sinful and unclean. We come to you admitting that sin has dug its ugly claws into our lives and holds us hostage with fear, guilt, and shame. But Lord, we are so thankful for your lavish love for us that you sent your Son. You sent Jesus to purchase us from the cost of sin with his blood and his life. We are so thankful for Jesus rescuing us from the clutches of sin and for your forgiveness of us through Jesus. Lord, restore unto us the joy of your salvation. Amen.